Chapter Six: The King's Castle. The train now arriving at platform two was the five twenty one to Bristol. The echoing voice boomed across the railway station. "That's ours!" cried Katie. "You have plenty of time," Mrs. Millward reassured her as they went through the ticket barrier. "Are you sure you have everything you need?" "Quite sure, Mum. Don't fuss, please." "I really don't understand you two girls. Why you should suddenly want to take off and work in a hotel is beyond me. You could have found nice, easy jobs nearer home." "You know that's not true, Mum." Well, perhaps not. I just suppose I don't want to see you go. We'll be back in no time at all. Yes, you will. A little older and a little wiser, I expect. Now, Joan, don't forget to ring your mother and father. I promised your mother I'd remind you. I won't forget. Good. Here's your train, you two interbit travelers. Take care of yourselves, won't you? We will," said Katie and Joan together. I adore train journeys, don't you? Katie pressed her nose against the window and watched the countryside whizzing past. Yes, they're so romantic. I wish we'd lived in the age of steam trains, though. There you go, always living in the past, Joe. In the future, people will look back at our time and say, "Wasn't it romantic when they had those diesel locomotives? Can't you see that the present is what matters? Now is the only important thing." You could be right," Joan was unconvinced. "Of course I am. Like a cheese, Sarney." Katie unwrapped her sandwiches and began to bite hungrily into one. "No, Ta," answered Joan, looking with disdain at her friend. "I'm not hungry right now. I feel too jumpy to eat." "Well, I'm starving," said Katie between bites. "Nothing affects your appetite, does it? They might give us a meal when we get there. It's a hotel, after all." We'll see, but I'm taking no chances," Katie grinned. "What time will we arrive? Do you think? Around seven, I should guess." Joan leaned back and closed her eyes. "In that case, I'm going to take a long nap." "Good idea," agreed Katie enthusiastically. "Who knows what's in store for us tomorrow? Adventure, excitement, danger." Joan opened her eyes in alarm and sat upright. Shut up, Katie! Please, you're making me scared. You don't really think we'll be in any serious danger, do you? Katie burst out laughing. Now, who's being melodramatic? You're always accusing me of reading too many adventure stories, but I think you're just as bad. You don't think there'll be any trouble then? Don't be silly. Of course not. What could happen, for goodness's sake? I don't know, do I? Mumbled Joan, now wearing a pretty worried expression. But what I do know is that some pretty strange things have happened to us so quickly. Why, if anyone had told me a couple of weeks ago that I'd be on my way to work in a classy hotel, I wouldn't have believed it. It just goes to show that you never know what's round the corner," said Katie gravely. "Just as well," whispered Joan to herself, staring out at the lush green pastures that looked so beautiful in the bright sunlight. She spoke out loud. The fields and meadows are lovely, Katie. Wouldn't you rather we had found jobs in a farm? It'll be much more tranquil. Nonsense! Retorted Katie. You're talking rot, Joe. Don't you remember when we stayed on my uncle's farm a couple of years ago? It wasn't in the least bit tranquil. Yes, I'd almost forgotten about that. I must admit it was busy in a tranquil sort of way. She said pedantically, "Couldn't we have a job there?" I could ask my uncle, but aren't you forgetting your prime motive in going to Bristol? I can hardly forget," groaned Joan. "Do cheer up," said Katie. "I hope you're not regretting all this, are you?" "Not really," Joan smiled. "I'm just having a bit of a moan. You know me well enough. Anyway, I'm going to have that nap I mentioned. So I'll thank you not to disturb me with lurid tales of dastardly deeds." Temple Mead Station was packed with rush hour travelers when the girls pulled in. Joan awoke with a start and rubbed her eyes. Where are we? Nice to see you back in the land of living," said Katie. "We're in Bristol. Did you sleep peacefully or did you have dreadful nightmares? Very pleasant dreams. I was a milkmaid on a farm in olden days, in the seventeenth or eighteenth century, sometime like that." Ah," said Katie cynically. 
Were there peasants sucking straws and leaning on gates, that sort of thing? Yes, yeah, something like that. You clot. That's just silly, sentimental rubbish. You know quite well that life wasn't pleasant in the past for most people. It was harsh and nasty. You may think I'm sobby, Katie, but I can't be as realistic and down-to-earth as you are. I suggest you come down to earth pretty quickly before the train fills up again and sets off back for home. After a short ride in the taxi, the two girls were standing in front of the impressive entrance to the King's Castle Hotel. Golly, it looks very grand, exclaimed Joan, looking up at the vast expanse of walls and windows and at the flag-draped canopy which jutted over the pavement. No need to be intimidated by a place like this, whispered Katie. Why are you whispering then? Katie gave Joan an exasperated look. At least we can have a perfect right to be here, which is more than can be said for a certain other person. Who? Oh, you mean... Yes, he'll be here tomorrow. Never mind tomorrow, said Joan nervously. Let's get tonight over with. She picked up her luggage. At the top of a short flight of marble surface steps stood a commissioner. Good evening, ladies. Let me call you a porter, he barked. Sam! Sam! What a foghorn, giggled Katie. Obviously an ex-sergeant major. A young man with wispy fair hair and wearing immaculately pressed trousers and waistcoat in the hotel's livery sprinted breathlessly down the steps. Okay, Mr. Bamford, he said to the commissioner. I'll see to these guests. We're not guests, explained Owen. We have come to work here. Really? smiled the young man. That's nice. I was only saying to Mary this afternoon that I wished Mr. Healy would hire some extra staff. He spoke in a strong West Country accent, and he blushed shyly as he took the girls' cases into the hotel lobby. Thanks very much, said Katie. Well, Joe and we are here at last, and we have already met two of her colleagues. She held out her hand to the young porter. Sam's your name, I gather. That's me, madam, er, miss. I am Katie Millwood, and this is my friend, Joe and Long. Pleased to meet you both, answered Sam, shaking their hands awkwardly. And my name's Albert Bamford, boomed the commissioner. We're delighted to meet you, Mr. Bamford, replied Katie. I imagine we'll be seeing a lot of each other. Sam, show these ladies to Mr. Healy's office, please, continued the commissioner. He puffed out his chest proudly and preened his wide gray mustache. I must say how refreshing it is to welcome two such personable young ladies to the king's castle. Don't you agree, Sam? I'll say it is, Mr. Bamford. Very, very refreshing. Thanks, Mr. Bamford, and I'm sure we'll be extremely happy here, piped up Joan. Sam led the girls down a thickly carpeted corridor and through beautiful polished wood doorways. This way to Mr. Healy's quarters, he said. What exactly be you two doing here? Helping Miss Monday do her paperwork? No, we're just a pair of dogs, buddies, laughed Joan gaily. Mr. Healy was a short, round man with a shiny face and a friendly but brisk manner. Just a couple of formalities, he said, as he fussed around his cluttered desk. Can you complete these forms? You're both a little younger than the management usually permits. But needs must, as the saying goes. We are very short of staff at the moment, and the staff that are here are getting rather harassed. Let's hope we can help them cope more easily, then, said Katie brightly. I'm sure you can, beamed Mr. Healy. Oh, let me see now. Where are those forms? Ah, here. As the girls filled in their names and details, Mr. Healy rambled on about how hard-pressed he and his staff were and about the terrible pressure they were under. Hmm, everything seems to be in order, he remarked, looking at their forms. Even if you're a bit young, still, it's just for the holidays, isn't it? I'm so glad to see you both get here in time for the weekend. We're having a pop star fellow staying with us, and he's bound to cause us a lot of extra work. Oh, really? said Katie innocently. Yes, you have probably heard of him. Betty Nicholson. Barry Nichols, do you mean? Joan butted in. That's the chappie. Whoever he is, he'll be overpaid and overrated. They always are. If there's one thing I could do without this week, it's a visit from this Betty Nichols and his hangers-on. I should have thought it would be good for the hotel's reputation to have a famous person here, suggested Joan meekly. 
Mr. Healy shot her an indignant look. Let me tell you, my dear, all it does is make my job a lot more difficult. He stopped and smiled. I'm afraid I'm becoming grouchy. I could do with a holiday myself. I'll outline your duties now because of the present situation. You won't be designated any specific tasks. You'll have to do whatever is needed at any particular time. In other words, said Katie, stifling a yawn, you want us to muck in generally. Er, yes, that's it. Cleaning, helping in the kitchen, waiting on tables, but not behind the bar. Joan interrupted. No, not there. You're too young. That suits us, grinned Katie. I never fancied being a barmaid anyway. When waiting on tables in two restaurants, you must wear the required uniform, of course, continued Mr. Healy. Silver service is a sort of an art form which you probably won't be familiar with. Our head waiter will help you in that respect. Overalls are available for cleaning. There may be some reception duties and telephones to answer, Miss Mundy will advise. For those tasks, you'll be expected to wear smart, everyday clothing. Your wages will be paid weekly in cash, an allowance having been deducted for your food and accommodation. Any questions? I can't think of any, said Katie, amazed by his quick, far job description. Neither can I, added Joan, but I expect we'll think of some later. You'll always find me in this office. I'll get Mary to show you to your room. Mr. Healy picked up the phone and asked for Mary to be sent round at once. Who is Mary? asked Katie. She's a general assistant. She helps around the place. Dogs, buddy, like us, Katie whispered to Joan. Mr. Healy tapped his fingertips impatiently on the desktop. Oh, where's that girl? He looked at his watch and scowled. Are you late for something, Mr. Healy? asked Joan. Not exactly, my dear. I'm just very time conscious. A quality I expect to see in my staff. A knock came at the door, and it opened. A fresh-faced young woman entered, smoothing down her overall with a plump pink hands. You wanted me, sir? She asked in a rich country burr. Mary, these two are new colleagues I told you were coming to help for the holiday period. I'll let you introduce yourselves, as I don't have time for formalities right now. Will you show them to your room, please? Number 48. Certainly, sir. I already prepared their room this morning, gushed Mary. But Mr. Healy was not listening. He had gathered up some papers from his desk and was marching out of the office. Mary's fair-skinned face was flushed, and that, combined with her pink hands and pink clothing, made her look just like a walking black man, thought Katie, amused, but she was pleasant and friendly, just like a black man. Joan and I are pleased to be here. I believe you're to show us what to do. That's right, but I'm not sure where to start. Let me think. Mary was obviously withdrawn and awkward. Joan, a shy girl herself, sensed this immediately, and, as often happened when she met such a person, she forgot her own shyness in her attempts to put the other at ease. Why don't you take Katie and me to our room? We've been traveling by train and we are a bit tired, she said. And hungry, Katie rubbed her tummy. Oh, don't worry, you won't be going hungry here. That's for sure, stressed Mary. Mr. Marshall sees we get plenty to eat. Come on, I'll show you upstairs. Then, when you're ready, I'll show you to the kitchen and you can have a pot of tea and meal. With that, Mary picked up both girls' cases as if they were weightless and set off. Have you worked here for long? Joan asked Mary. Me and my finance, eh? I've been here about six months. We're saving up to get married, you see? Mary dumped the luggage on the floor and after smoothing down her uniform again, she reached into the depths of her pocket. Look at this! In her work-roughened palm was a gold ring with a single sparkling diamond. I don't wear it when I'm cleaning in that. I'm scared of losing it because it's a bit loose. Sam would go mad if it were to get lost. He's still paying on the installments. It's beautiful, gushed Joan. Very nice, agreed Katie. Sam's your fiancé, the young man who showed us in. Yes, it'd be Sam. He's head porter, but he does other things as well, like I do. I'm supposed to be a waitress, but I do all sorts of other jobs. Sam and me, we do anything that needs doing. Sam lost his last job, so you're grateful to be earning it all. We know how you feel, said Joan sympathetically. Mary placed her precious ring in her pocket. When I'm waiting on, I wear it, though I have to be careful I don't drop it in the soup. She let out a raucous laugh. 
We may as well go in the lift. I don't usually do so myself. I can't be bothered waiting. But seeing as we've got all these cases, I think we will. What floor are we on? asked Katie. The fourth. It ain't too bad. Phew, breathed Katie. I think we'll be taking the lift all the time. I can't see myself running up and down four flights of stairs. Me neither, said Joan. I'm so tired I'd be glad to get to a room and flop down on the bed. End of chapter 6